it is it is in depth, so I still will probably go over those seven minutes that everyone else has got on transplant. So yeah, and, and just so you guys know what I'm gonna go through, um yeah, I gotta keep it kind of interesting, but it's very a lot of facets, it's very in depth. Um, and I've got I kind of skim skim the tops of it. So you guys know. We've got a thread Dean, he's not so great with technology. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to be an entrepreneur, and just like any other entrepreneur, you have to kind of decide, okay, so what's going to be the next big thing? You know, if I was Bill Gates, he, he decided, you know, maybe computers are going to be the next big thing, right? Jim Carnegie, he's like, hey, this whole steel thing, that would be pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, so something I really, I think is going to be the next big thing is space. And I'm seeing this in the privatized industry, and I think we're at the tipping point. I think the... I think we're coming up to the top of the hill, and we're slowly making it over, we just have enough, and we're, it's going to take off pretty soon. And we're seeing that with companies uh, such as SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, uh, Moon Express, and China. I know China's not a company, but they are <laughs> in the privatized space industry. And uh, what I, I want to do is get into lunar mining. So at this point, you guys are thinking, what, Darren, uh, <laughs> why the moon? Why would you want to go there? And so to that, I say there is platinum group metals. There is uh, rare earth metals. And judging by their name, yes, they're rare here on Earth. So yeah. Yeah. Um, three and, moon and uh, just rare moon rocks. Oops. OK, so uh, platinum, the platinum group, and the rare earth metals. I think could turn a fairly immediate profit. We can use them almost immediately here on Earth. We all know that they're expensive and they're worth a lot of money. Uh, rare earth metals are commonly used in our uh, technology and in high demand. They're only found in two places on Earth. And so, yeah, those will turn a quick profit. But something I'm a little bit more interested in is helium 3. So, what helium 3 is, it's a light isotope with helium that can be used for clean nuclear fusion energy. Okay, uh, it's a small version of helium, and when you bomb, bombard it with a deuterium atom that I have here, and uh, so you bond it with a deuterium atom, it crushed together, this is exactly what happens in the sun, and out comes a normal helium atom, which you put in your balloon, and a proton and energy. Okay, now this creates more energy than a fission nuclear reaction that we have, plus there is no nuclear waste after. And in fact, helium is almost out on Earth, and they expect our helium supply to be out by 2050. So this will also create um, a source of helium, which is used for rocket fuel and, and of course, party balloons. Um, so, and, and so why is this a big deal? Because, uh, well, we don't have it here on Earth because of our gravitational field that protects us. And uh, in fact, that's what you see. You see helium, it comes, it comes from out of the sun. It's part of the fusion um, reactions that in the sun. They come out, it's emitted from the sun. And uh, it bounces off of our gravitational field. And that's actually what we see in Aurora Borealis or uh, Northern Lights. And, uh, but the moon does not have this gravitational field to protect it. And therefore, it's been collecting on the moon for billions and billions of years. Um, so essentially, all the soil is composed of it. All I have to take is handful of soil, throw it in a furnace, bada bing, bada boom, out comes the helium-3, and, uh, and we're good to use it. Uh, and so beyond that, helium-3 is estimated to be worth $4 billion a ton, and a current space shuttle can hold 53 tons worth of cargo, and that's expected to increase in as space technology is revolutionized uh, in the next few years, and I think it will. Um, and so you guys think, so why haven't anybody thought of it? No one else has done this. Well, in fact, a lot of countries have had the idea of going. Um, United States, Russia, China, India. Um, but that was back in the early 2000s. Funding got cut when the recession hit. And so I, that's why I think a lot of this is going towards privatized, as we see with SpaceX and NASA is giving out millions of dollars worth of grants so these private companies can make for them. Um, and so, okay, at this point you guys are saying, okay, so that's nice and all, but how are you going to get there? How are you going to get yourself off of Earth? 
how come nobody else has been able to do this, and um, how are you going to get there? Okay, so I, I'm a proponent of the dual launch system. I've learned that many, there's many concepts out there, but I think this is the best concept. So what you do is you have a small rocket that carries the passengers, your astronauts. Um, it goes up on a smaller rocket, and uh, this is just an example. This is one of NASA's proposed ideas um, of a smaller rocket. And then the other one is a much larger rocket that's comparable to the ones that we used during the Apollo missions. Um, to send up all your cargo, your mining equipment, your lunar base, which we'll talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, and so we're going to call it the crew rocket. And I put rocket in parentheses because uh, I don't like rockets. I think, they're, I think they're stupid. I think they're counterintuitive um, by, by their design. Uh, I like the idea of what we call this is style launcher. I'm going to give you guys some love over here. I'm going to show it on this side. Um, so basically it's a giant plane that holds a rocket right in the middle. As you can see, it'll, it'll drop the rocket two, three. Uh, it already has velocity. It's already high up in the air, so you don't have to worry about wasting all that fuel and getting from zero velocity to the 200 kilometers a second necessary. I mean, I think that's the right number. 200 kilometers a second to break the Earth's atmosphere to escape velocity. Uh, and also, I'm looking at using reusable rockets, so the parts that fall off, rather than just letting them burn, waste the money, let them burn and crash back to Earth, uh, you actually reuse them, which makes sense. So, uh, yeah, then, so there's also the big rocket. Uh, this is going to take the cargo. Um, SpaceX, they're a cargo company that's being developed for space. Uh, this is just an example of one of their large rockets that they plan on using. Uh, the Falcon XX is actually the proposed uh, rocket for going to Mars. Um, so it'll be similar to that. Uh, and I keep putting up these numbers here that I didn't explain on the last slide, but basically you have to get it down to how much money per kilogram is it going to cost to send a rocket up there. And uh, when they sent out the Apollo missions, it was about $54,900, so $55,000 for every kilogram that your rocket was. So it's important to make your rocket as small as possible and minimize that cost. And in recent years, it's gone down from $55,000 a kilogram to $50 a kilogram with SpaceX. And in fact, with my crew launch, the, the crew rocket that we talked about, I went down to about $25. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about the lunar base. Okay, so the lunar base it has to be small, it has to be uh, portable, and it has to um, it has to give us safety from the radiation in the hostile environment of the moon. So uh, I've seen again, I've seen many concepts, I've seen many ideas. This is my favorite concept. Uh, somebody at NASA developed a, an idea where. It's an inflatable, it almost kind of looks like a donut. Here's a little pod that lands with the cargo ship. Um, uh, it starts off as a cylinder and it inflates. And when it, becomes, when it inflates, it becomes very hard. And you see there's living quarters all around this center donut, which is actually a radiation uh, room, if you will. So if there's a radiation storms coming from the sun, because they don't have that gravitational field that we talked about earlier, they can go inside there. Themselves. So, but once you have people going up there on a regular basis and uh, this lunar base gets established, you can add on more and more of these pods and maybe a lunar economy starts to develop. And after a few years, uh, you have a few more of these pods. You have more astronauts living up there. You have solar panels that have been developed for their energy. You have greenhouses for their own food. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But, you know, it gives you the idea of where this can go. Um, and how this is going to develop. Um, okay, so after all this, like, okay, well, you guys got a cool rocket and you got a cool little, you know, clubhouse, <laughs> but uh, how are you actually going to get this stuff? And so again, you, you, I see a lot of concepts out there. But my favorite concept that I found um, is developed at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, now, this tractor, if you will, it's automated. Uh, it goes along the soil of the moon. And it has this grinder in the front that picks up the soil, goes through a fluid filtration system, heats it up, and uh, the end product is the helium three is extracted. Also, hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen is extracted from the regolith, which is the lunar soil. And the depleted regolith is shot out the back. So it essentially goes over, takes everything out of the soil that we need, and it sends out the other stuff in the back. Um, and uh, as you can see, once you get more of this equipment up there, you can have a chain of 
uh, collection of tractors, if you will, to maximize profit. So, so at, at this point, I haven't impressed you, and you guys don't like this idea. I, I want to say, um, well, going to the moon is an essential stepping stone for humans to become spacefaring people. So we talk about the lunar base. You have people going up to the to the base on a, a regular basis. It's expanding. It's growing. Um, and after a while, you're going to develop fuel depots up there. So what that means is it we waste so much fuel to get off of, off of Earth, and you get to the moon, and you're able to actually refuel your ships, which opens up the option of going into deep space travel, uh, going to other planets, uh, setting up bases on other planets. Um, you can also create dry docks to make more Star Wars-like uh, ships because you're only on one-sixth of the gravity, so why not build a ship that's six times bigger than you could build here on Earth? So, um, yeah, and then, like I said, it opens up the idea of going to other planets, possibly asteroid mining, and so here's one of my last things. Uh, if you have people going to the moon, this is, I think this is the most exciting part, is if you have people going to the moon on a regular basis, someone's going to capitalize on it and say, okay, well, let's build, put a hotel here so people can come and visit this lunar city and uh, just get to experience that. So you wake up and you don't see sign light because you're only in one sixth of gravity. And you look at your window and you see the Earth crawl crawling over the horizon and you, you like that so you go and you uh, you go down to the rec center, you jump down the stairs and you fall out of the and down to the bottom because you're only six, you know, one sixth of gravity. You go uh, to the diving the diving board, which is six times higher than anything you have here on Earth. Um, you also you could go, um, can you imagine playing basketball on one sixth the ground? <laughs> I would be awesome. <laughs> so, and if that got good, that like, would, be, would be great. Um, and then what's even cooler is you could strap on a pair of wings and jump off of a cliff and you could actually fly in one sixth gravity. Man's oldest dream, only attainable there on the moon. And that's pretty cool if you ask me. So if nothing else inside you, maybe that. So on my last slide here, um, I, I talked about Andrew Carnegie in the beginning. He's one of my kind of heroes. So back in the day when he kind of came up with this idea of the steel mills, they were expensive, they were unknown, and it could, it could fail easily. But he got the investors to put in, uh, to allow him to build a factory that was a hundred, the size of 100 football fields on something he didn't even know would work. And they fired up that first steel mill and it turned him into the second richest man who has ever lived. So he, he says, the first man gets the oyster and the second man gets the shell, and I really would like an oyster. So, thanks for listening. <laughs>